everybody, my name is Luke Marr and this is Hot Love Mode and today on Hot Love Mode we are coming to you with our can, can, can 2022 fashion roast and review. As you guys know, the iconic film festival held in the south of France. There's quite a lot to discuss. I'm actually very excited about Cannes this year because honestly, it's kind of grown on me. It's very much so the really gorgeous, pretty, stunning, simple or like meant to be simple red carpet, I would say. And so I'm pumped. And luckily we have a huge shout out to today's sponsor who is LG. LG has provided Hot Limode with their LG Cinebeam model HU715QW short throw projector, which has been a fantastic help with getting to see the beauty of the Cannes Film Festival in such vivid 4K quality. As of right now, I actually don't have any TVs in my apartment as I just moved, but I'm honestly reconsidering even buying any since the LG Cinebeam doesn't require any installation or even a movie specific room. I've had mine set up in my living room and as you can tell, it works perfectly. Can is always such a beautiful red carpet and it really requires crisp quality to appreciate as the clothes we see are usually simple and sleek, but very high quality, haute couture like, which makes the LG Cinebeam the perfect medium to display the event. Between the 2500 ANSI lumens, a 2 million to 1 contrast ratio, and a native 4K UHD, its specs are out of this world. And it has two built in sound systems and LG Web OS wireless connectivity to streaming services like Netflix, Disney Plus. Apple TV, and of course, YouTube. There's nothing you cannot do with it. On top of that, the LG Cinebeam is so sleek and fancy, and it just works perfectly in my minimal apartment. Not only because there isn't a lot of furniture, but also because the crisp white and gray appearance just fits so snugly into my place, and it doesn't look clunky and old fashioned like projectors of years gone by. You know what I mean? Like when you'd walk by a projector, it would go all black and you'd see my silhouette, but no, 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 not here. And now let me show you all how large it can get. You only need 21.7 centimeters, which is about the size of a man's hand. And it can go up to an 120 inch large screen all in 4K. Yeah, I know. And just like LG's TVs, it has all the apps, streaming services, and easily accessible remote control features. And you can even plug in your USB, HDMI, and ethernet cables. So for those looking to game or connect other devices, it's perfect for that too. And I mean, the Wi-Fi connectivity aspect of it is stupendous. And I don't say that about Wi-Fi connectivity often. And for Can, it's been such a big help. Not only do I get to see the beautiful gowns and crisp suits that walk the red carpet in such fine detail, but the LG Cinebeam almost transports you and makes you feel like you're in the south of France on the carpet with celebrities like Lori Harvey or Julianne Moore or Anne Hathaway. And thanks to LG and the LG Cinebeam, Beam, it's really helped to step up my reviews as it's given me the ability to see with the true nature of the red carpet even though I'm not there. Now listen, I can clock a sequin from over there on this thing. So obviously thank you to LG and click the link in my description box below to check out the LG Cinebeam HU715QW for yourself. I promise you, you won't be disappointed. And now without further ado, let's get into this can 2022 fashion roast and review. So thank you LG, and with that, let's get into this red carpet roast and review. First up, we have Adriana Lima, or Adriana Lima. I don't know how you actually say that, but she is wearing Balmain. Now, I believe that this is a custom look and it is a tightly pleated and gathered gown that is made up of black fabric. There's a little bit of a shoulder pad action going on. There's a sort of cross situation sort of drape. And then we have an expose cut out at the stomach. And then there's gathering that comes and pools right below the stomach, falls down in the front, and then gathers out towards the side in the skirt. There is I believe sleeves that sort of extend past hand and sort of go down and drop to the floor to sort of bring some sort of drama there as well. Honestly though, I think the point of the look is that Adriana Lima is pregnant and that's sort of what we are making the main focus, which listen, love the baby bump. Very, very chic, very chic accessory, which I know is like not the way to talk about it, but like at the same time, like that's the way to talk about it. You only get it for nine months before you have to like get it again. When you have it, use it. 
I do think that the shoulder pads and the exposed stomach are really, really great. I think they're fashion forward. I think they're a little bit out there. I think they're a little bit l'enfant terrible, sort of, you know, French young, rebellious fashion, man-child at the head of an iconic fashion, haute couture, house, and I like to see it. But I think the black and the gathering is actually really, really rather simple in that regard. It's not trying to like fight for attention with, you know, rhinestones or color or anything like that. In reality, the black allows the cutout, the shoulder pads and the texture of the pleating and the draping to be the main focus. I think that she looks great. I think she looks wonderful. I think she looks lovely. I think it's daring and exciting, but at the same time, very elegant, very chic, very appropriate for Cam. Next up, we have Alessandra Ambrosio, and she's wearing George's Hobika. It's a, what I believe, a feathered bralette, like a bandeau of feathers. Honestly, like, she's intriguing. Don't really see too much of that situation going on here. You know what she is? She's full. That, that I will give credit where credit is due for. And then it's a high-waisted skirt with a crystal rhinestone waist embellishment. And then we can see that there are diamond and teardrop and little floral cutouts that honestly, considering the skirt is full of rhinestones, I feel like the, the laser cutout on the leather is probably a reference to the rhinestone experience. Honestly, I have to say it, like the skirt is actually really intriguing. It's something that definitely caught my eye. I really appreciate. I just kind of wish that the skirt and the top had something in common. I love the idea of the feathers and I love how full they are. They're really beautiful. It's really fun, but I just wish that there was some sort of tie in between feathers and then rhinestones and cutouts. If we had just done a version of the skirt made into a top, as well, would have been like killing it. Had we done a version of the top turned into a skirt, I would have been killing it. Separately, I think they're both really, really intriguing together. I don't like hate them, I don't despise them, but I just, again, wish that they were coinciding a little bit more. Next up, we have Alicia Vikander and she is wearing Louis Vuitton. Now, I believe this is a custom look and I believe it's based on fall 2022. I think it's really, really cool. It's a bustier top. We can see that it's full of seams and stitches. It's in like a cream and then they're a little sort of black top ties that are dotting all around. And then the top has a sort of front peplum that then falls out into two sort of panels that fall down the side and almost create a train or they do create a train effect to a degree. And then the two panels are both fringed with black sort of leather strips. And then they also sort of carry this little tiny tie situation motif experience all the way down. And then just paired underneath is a pair of simple black pants, which I think are great because also the panels are lined in black, so it's not like anything underneath this peplum top with panel trains is taking away from the fact that it's a peplum top with panel trains. The shoes, I think, work totally fine. I get it. I do think it's a really cool custom take on the fall 2022 silhouette that we saw. I think that honestly, it's a nice way to sort of drama and intrigue and excitement, but at the same time, done in a way that's a little bit tailored, a little bit more refined. It's not your usual run-of-the-mill dress, but rather it's that Nicolas Jesquier intrigue, interest, construction, deconstruction, reconstruction-ness that honestly like we all deserve. So I stand. Next up we have Anne Hathaway. She's wearing Armani Privé. I mean like she is the moment. She is the time. She is the timeline. She is the father time. She is baby new year. She is all of the time. She is mother nature. She is, I don't know, the devil. She is whatever your version of God, Yahweh, Allah, Jesus Christ. Who knows? She is all of it. She just encompasses all of the things of the world that I need in my life. Now I know you guys are gonna be like, Luke, it's so simple. It's so boring. Well like, no, it's not. And also it's Armani Privé. So like if you consider it simple and boring, that's what Armani Privé does, but they do it so elegantly that it always looks good, or at least for the most part, it always looks good. So it's essentially a square sequin top sort of bandeau that, that's cropped very, very low, and then a super high-waisted square sequin skirt, which in reality sort of creates an empire waistline via, you know, this sort of very, very skim and scant little exposure of skin. And I think it's a fun way and something that I think we also recently were talking about with billboards is a thing that is going to be a moment, it's going to exist. And it's kind of a chic way to modernize the silhouettes of something like Bridgerton and the Regency period. And I love it. I also think the fact that these sequins are laid like so perfectly is amazing. It speaks to the hand craftsmanship that goes into an Armani Privé look. Armani Privé, if you guys don't know, is the haute couture version 
of Giorgio Armani's main sort of line. And then you have a beautiful silk off the shoulder sort of wrap. Now from the front, you're kind of like, oh, maybe it's attached to the back, who knows? No, no, no. There's pictures of this wrap from the back. It like hurts my head. As we can see at the back, it's sort of draped to create almost like a bow shape. And then at the center of the back, it does sort of create a little gathered and pleated sort of strip that almost creates a bow. So it looks like Anne Hathaway has put her arms through a bow, not like the bow was tied around her arms at the back, but rather the space in between the sort of loop of bows. That's what she put her arms through, which is like so good and so smart and so cool. And then the bow in and of itself, the sort of way that it comes down, it creates a long, beautiful silk train. It doesn't take away from the white sequins of the dress, but rather sort of creates the drama via the stole wrap situation like it's just a really well done thought out situation of three different garments that create a really cohesive beautiful look they're beautifully made it fits her magnificently and each of them really does encompass a gorgeous sort of element of either drape or embroidery or just perfect styling in closing when discussing this look i feel like i fell down and smacked my little head on the pavement because i'm just in like a euphoric dizziness over this moment iconic next up let's talk about bella hadid now she wore a vintage versace piece which made me feel really good about myself not because like i'm a stylist but because this vintage Versace piece was actually one that we low-key featured when we were doing our Met Gala Roast and Review Part 2. Essentially, this is a look from a 1987 production of Salon Me, which is a play by Oscar Wilde. Gianni Versace loved to sort of do ballet, theater, costumes. It was something that he and sort of many other designers within the later end of the 20th century sort of did. And this gown, was one that we discussed because of this beautiful front swag, which we'll talk about after. But now let's put the sketch up and then you can do a little zoom in of like the book and how the sketch is on the book. That's the brilliance. It was just really, really cool to see, like love the fact that we're getting vintage Versace from Bella. She honestly like is a vintage girl. She's working with La Roche. And we have seen recently from Bella that there was a Dior by Yves Saint Laurent, beautiful gown that she wore. And again, it just sort of goes to show that La Roche and vintage are very much so sort of intertwined. I mean, we've seen Anya Taylor-Joy in vintage Bob Mackie. We've seen Zendaya in vintage Yves Saint Laurent au couture. So it's no different with Bella, which we honestly, we love to say. But let's talk about the gown though. See, she would have been perfect for the mat. That's the truth. But here we can see that there is a silk gathered bustier. It's textured. If we zoom in, we can see that there is really sort of like a tight sort of gather and it's almost like a ribbed texture. The draped bodice actually is in black Georgette. And then there is a flourish at the waist, which is crafted from silk taffeta. It's a beautiful sort of flourish. It's big, it's poofy. It comes out from the right side of the dress and sort of creates shape. And then we have a little velvet skirt so the velvet skirt really starts at like the hips, but luckily, you know, the velvet sort of creates a little bit of a flourish and a blot for those that like Harry Potter. But it, it does honestly like look really, really cool. I also love the fact that with Versace looks like this, we're not just going for like spring summer 1976. Like it's nice to see that there are elements of the Versace history that we don't normally get to see or don't normally talk about all that often sort of being brought to the red carpet, specifically by Bella. The look in and of itself looks stunning. Her in a garbage bag would look good for the most part. So the fact that she's wearing this gorgeous, stunning fitted gown with this big sort of flourish, it's lovely. From the back, we can also see that the flourish sort of juts out more so asymmetrically on the right side. And there's a little bit of like a, a gather that sort of showcases that it's like a big sort of bow, but it's asymmetrical. Listen, I just love that there's like a reference going on. I think it works. I think it looks gorgeous on her. She knows what she's doing. You know, have we done this for the Met Gala? Would've been a little bit better, but like, hey, doesn't hurt, doesn't hurt. We stand, we're big fans. Next up we have Carla Bruni and she is wearing a custom Celine look. It's a luscious, beautiful little pinkish purple slip dress. It has a little drape neckline, very 90s feeling. Color honestly I think is nice. It's frothy, it's light. 
It's pinkish plum. It's embroidered fully in what looks like a sort of fishnet style. It looks like it's also cut on the bias because we can actually see the seam if we zoom in really, really close there, where it sort of descends down, which gives it the ability to be that sort of very languid, fitted, very 1990s reference, but at the same time, it's really a reference like Madeline VNA and the ability to cut things on the bias. Shout out, Madeline. It's just a pretty dress, and for Can, that's fine to me. I think that's appropriate. I think it looks really wonderful. It fits her gorgeously. Color is lovely. The embroidery lets it really sort of shine and gives a little bit of a different texture to it. The drape works. The bias cut great. Overall, very enjoyable. Now we have Carla also in a Saint Laurent look, which I think is funny because it's like Celine, Saint Laurent, Saint Laurent, Celine. It is a brown look that is draped and it is a reference, or at least it is a look from fall 2022, which is a reference to Yves Saint Laurent collections of the 1970s, in my opinion. It's this beautiful sort of chocolate brown color. And listen, I understand like the diamond shapes that are cut in and then sort of the gathering emit from them is a little bit stark. It's a little bit hard to understand. We can also see that it very obviously is sort of cut on the bias, sort of does a little obtuse angle. I love an obtuse angle all of a sudden, but an obtuse angle sort of cut out and that's what lets that sort of skirt fall down in a very sort of vertical fashion, whereas the rest of the dress gathers out horizontally when it fits around sort of the top of the thigh and the bodice. <sighs> Here's my thing about the dress. It's not really some like immaculate, amazing, wonderful dress in terms of red carpet stunning moments from Saint Laurent. I think it's a great reference to the history of Saint Laurent. You know, I love a, a little YSL reference, have no problem with it. I just think for the carpet, there maybe are better looks from this collection specifically that we could have tapped into, maybe like a green because there is a green version of this dress to a degree that I think would have popped a little bit more. I just don't think the brown is like can. I, I love the idea of the brown. I love the idea of pulling the dress, putting it on, just in the actual grand scheme of things, it's not really a super duper exciting dress for this red carpet. You know what I mean? We really got to do like beauty over the top glamour, da 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 da. And I feel like there are a lot of great summer references in this collection. There are, it's a wonderful collection. If I ever put the video about fall 2022 out, you'll see it, it's wonderful. I just don't think here in this moment, this was the exact perfect look to choose. Next up we have Cindy Bruna and she is wearing John Battista Valli. Now it's a confection of pink frothy tulle. Now the thing that I would say sets this apart from the majority of like the John Battista looks that we discuss and talk about is the fact that it's off the shoulder, which I think is fun because it gives it a chop element, almost like it was purposely sort of like cut off, like the sleeves were just from the top, almost like, I don't know, cutting the wheat from the chaff. I don't know if that's a good example here, but like, you know what I mean? Like a Scythe just took it and said, chop it. And Cindy sort of like ducked down and then she came back up and they're like, oh my God, wait, her head's still on. She looks good. Cool. I love that aspect of it. And I feel like for John Batista Bali, whose signature really is this tool, it's all about sort of making that different and memorable and making it not feel like the same look that we've seen over and over and over and over again. And I think this is a good example of trying to do that. I think that it honestly works. I think the off the shoulder looks great. The pink, you know, frothy layers of tulle, the brand, I can't, I, you know, I can't, I can't really be so mad at it because that's what this business is sort of based on. And I do think it looks nice. I do think it is fun. I think the fact that you also have like this necklace sort of going on here, it allows that ability for that to sort of be not just lost in a tool confection of cotton candy. It's your usual John Batista Bali tool, but there's a little bit different going on with the off the shoulder and that I can appreciate. Next up we have Topeka Padukone. Now she is wearing Louis Vuitton. This is a custom look. It's a red simple gown with a little peplum flare, a plunging neckline. You know what my thing is about a Louis Vuitton custom is it, it has to be exciting. You know what I mean? Like Nicolas Jasquier, if he is anything, He's not boring, ever. You know what I mean? Like, you're, it's almost like somebody hit you from 47 different angles with like 47 different weapons. Cause you don't know what's going on, but you know that something different is happening at every point. So when you have just one element that is so simple, you're almost like waiting for the second 
hit. And I think that's what the issue is here for me. Is it's just so simple. And I understand for Ken, that is what it should be and all that. But it's also not like so simple and so stunning. And that's my issue. I think that had we done no peplum, I would have been able to say like, yeah, it's very pretty. The bodice fits beautifully. Like it really, really does. Like those darts really are like stunning. They are, they're gorgeous. I think it's just the peplum is a little bit odd. Which again, I get is like Nicolas Jasquier. It's like not odd enough for me to say, oh, I don't understand it. It's odd enough where I'm like, we could have done without her or we could have done something with her. So yeah, like don't love, don't love the peplum. She can go. Thank you. Next up we have Dipika Padukone and she is wearing Sabaya Sachi. If I said it wrong, I apologize. Listen, it's nothing personal. It's just, I am illiterate. So she's wearing what essentially is a brown, white, and gold striped dress. It's done in a shit ton of sequins. Like that thing is covered in sequins. The way that it's wrapped asymmetrically, which is usual for sari, I believe, exposes a little bit of a black sort of bralette underneath on one side, which honestly I think is kind of chic. I like the idea of sort of taking the sari and making it a little bit more, you know, exposed. I understand like maybe from a cultural standpoint, not exactly what is the norm. I do think that it's always fun to sort of see plays on traditional clothing because it's something that I think we talk a lot about when it comes to European Western fashion designers and how they take 18th century, 19th century clothing and sort of remix it and rework it. I think it's the same thing when it's a designer from a country or a brand from a country like India where the sari is an origin garment or a garment of origin to see it sort of played on. So I think this is kind of kind of chic. I think the colors work on her really, really well. It's not like crazy over the top, ridiculous, but I do think that in general, like it's nice. I think it's her paying homage to her country where she's from. Uh, yeah, I'm not gonna say I'm really like, well, it's so boring because I think it's not. I do think that the idea of all the different elements of the wrapping, so we can see that the section that goes over the shoulder sort of comes in at the bottom to a section that's being at like a 90 degree angle of itself. I think it's interesting. And also, I guess, I wonder if it's actually draped because I know that the normal sari is like fully wrapped and draped and wrapped and draped and wrapped and draped. And I feel like here, instead of embroidering a shit ton of fabric with a shit ton of sequins, which is probably ridiculously expensive. I feel like here, what we've done is we've done like a trompe l'oeil version of the sari is we've taken the yards and yards and yards and yards and yards of fabric that normally you would wrap and wrap and wrap and wrap and wrap and instead made it look like that's what we've done, but we have not done that, which I feel like is also cost effective, but also like a fun play on, again, the traditional garment. So I like it. I think it's interesting. I think it's intriguing. I think that if I was to get to like see it up close and personal, I'd have even more to say about it, but so far, so good. Next up, we have Diane Kruger and she is wearing Oscar de la Renta. I think this dress might be custom. If it's not, I apologize to a degree because the girls don't have me on the, on the press for these lists, you know what I mean? So like, who knows? But I do think it's an intriguing dress for Oscar. Now listen, I know you're gonna be like, Luke, it's a red dress, it's a big train. Yeah, 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 I know, I know, I know, it is. But I do think it's intriguing to sort of see the skirt, which is this sort of draped over the top, quite loud, quite bolsterous, textured train of what I presume is a very expensive silk. And then as we reach the waist, we can actually see the drape sort of coming in, like the pleating and the gathering of it sort of cinches in the waist. I will say that the bodice, which is a halter style, which that's the interesting thing to me is the use of this very backless halter is really intriguing. I think it's a very interesting element and I think it gives it a little bit more of like a sex appeal, which you aren't usually getting when it comes to a big ball gown, unless it has like a very interesting neckline or it's exposing certain things. Like it's just, it's just not super common to see that. I do think we've actually done a great job of sort of A, shaping the waist, creating a hourglassy effect, but not using a belt. We love that, very grateful for that. And utilizing that gathering and the actual fabric to create that way. So like shout out Oscar, listen, again, when you have simple looks, you gotta look at that little minute detailing. I will say the fit of it's like fine, it works. I will say, I don't know what's going on at the neckline. I presume that that's not Oscar Laurent's fault because I don't think they make jewelry, like whatever that is, but it's kind of heinous, I'll be honest. It's not a great thing to have put over that neckline because again, like the halter is meant to be the center of the neck. So like we should have done something else. Whoever styled this, I'm happy that we got whoever to pay for, you know, the jewelry placement. That's lovely, that's wonderful, but she looks like a Christmas present. It's just a little bit too gold sparkle ribbon 
on a red dress for me. Like it just, it reads Christmas and that's that's my biggest issue. I actually think the dress in and of itself for Oscar de la Renta is very sort of fashion forward E. It's still that very American sort of simple classicness. But I think it has elements of it that allow, again, the fabric to use and do the constructive elements of shaping the body, which is important. Of course, I'd love to see a little bit more drama, but for the most part, like, I think this works. The jewelry just needs, so uh, like, we needed something else. A big earring. Totally fine. Do it. A lot of bracelets and bangles or something like down the back. People, you have a whole backless element. Why not do some crazy down the back jewelry? Come on, come on, come on. Next up we have Dee Dee Stone and she is wearing what I believe is custom Roberta Cavalli. This look, in my opinion, is inspired by two different styles from fall 2022. And as we can see, it consists of a sort of bondage top held together by brassy straps. And each of the sort of intersections holds a gold flower. Then when we hit like the sort of top of the pelvis area, it's at like obtuse angle and showcases the top of the hip area. And it's in a little sort of white or creamy silk skirt. Now it looks like again, we're sort of taking elements of the bondage and BDSM sort of aesthetic from that collection and creating the top and then sort of doing the little obtuse angle element for the actual skirt and the way that it's constructed. I appreciate it. I do think that had we done maybe a gold skirt, that would have really like pulled the look together because I think that there is a little bit of offness with having like this cream skirt, again, brass and the gold. And so I wish that we had sort of coincided those two things together, but I do appreciate that we went sort of a little bit more avant-garde and sort of daring on the can red carpet. I also just appreciate sort of wearing something like this because I never would. Like I don't hate it. I just wish the skirt sort of had like delivered a little bit more and coincided a little bit more. But I can appreciate that we wore a literal BDSM bondage inspired gown on the can red carpet when everybody else is doing pretty, 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 pretty princess. Next up we have Elle Fanning. She's wearing Armani Privé. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is about like right now Armani Privé, what it's doing to me, but like this is again another example of just like a beautiful gown. It's not like even a contrived beautiful gown, you know what I mean? It's not like your usual, oh, I've seen it a million times. No, it's like a pale pink strapless gown in what looks like a gorgeous tulle that is covered in these little rhinestones, but just the way that it fits, like the way that that waist fits is just dreamy. It's ethereal. It's almost like impossible because it just, it just fits so, so well. And the way that it, juts out at the hips and sort of creates, again, a sort of emphasis on the waist. And then comes down to like the top of the thigh and creates a kind of big er skirt. I wouldn't say this is trumpet in reality. Maybe it is technically a trumpet skirt, but I feel like trumpet hits like mid thigh and then flares out. But maybe this is like a high trumpet. We could also just say that it's like a drop waist kind of feeling because it does sort of hit a drop waist area and then it flares out. But the godets on it are gorgeous. That's what sort of gives it that bumpy sort of falling out feeling. You can see like there's a little bit of whiteness in the skirt. Those are the godets that sort of create that triangular shape as it descends down. And even with that, I do wish there was maybe like a little bit more coverage of the white areas, but overall like it's a stunning dress. I also think the fact that on this tool we did these little crystals instead of doing like a sequin or a paillette or you know just like your usual rhinestones I think it adds just that extra oomph of like difference to the look even though it's very very simple in terms of construction it adds that oomph but also the magnificence of yes it is a simple dress but it's been done so impeccably you know what I mean when people say on things like the Great British Bake Off or competition shows of if you're gonna do something simple it has to be perfect this is an example of doing something simple but it is perfect it's different in so many sweet ways but at the same time it's so understandable I think to the mainstream person and I think that's the beauty of Giorgio Armani and specifically Armani Privé is it's just so simple but so elegant like this is an example of a timeless dress stunning Elle Fanning I am standing Elle Fanning. Next up we have Emily Radajkowski and she is wearing custom Miu Miu. It's essentially a black slip dress in lace. We can see at the neckline that the lace also has sort of been left to sort of fray out. And it's incredibly sheer, which 
not a problem, but it does have sort of floral lace motifs and then it's covered in little crystals of some sort because the, the dress shines. It fits her immaculately, although I mean like it's Emily Rajkowski, so like I don't think many people are having fit issues there. But what we've done is we've added a little belt at the underbust. I presume to sort of create an emphasis on like an empire waistline, but the dress isn't really like an empire waistline dress. So looking at the, the most recent Mew Mew shows, a lot of these belts sort of appear on the waist. They don't really appear at sort of like an empire bust line. So I'm wondering if like we're gonna see that, you know, for spring 2023 over at Mew Mew. But all in all, like it's a pretty dress, nothing really crazy, nothing really kooky. It works, she looks stunning. That's great, that's gorgeous. You know, do I wish it was like a little bit more exciting? Sure, absolutely. But like for Can, she looks gorge. So like, we'll take it. Next up we have Eva Longoria and she's wearing Alberta Ferretti. It's pretty much a sheer slip dress that is covered in different panels, of opaque fabrics. So like sometimes it's just simple chiffons and stuff like that. Sometimes it's just simple little pieces of opaque black. Other times it's embroidery and, you know, floral shapes and flower petals and all of that. It's just not really great, you know what I mean? Like it's not super interesting and it, it fits her well, I will say, but I think just the rest of what encompasses the dress besides the fit of it is just meh, you know what I mean? Like. I think now we're also at a place with designers like Anenzi Dojaka. If you're gonna do really simple black stuff, you gotta deliver. Like it has to be impeccable. Otherwise, eh, you know what I mean? Like shout out Helmet Lang, good example of like simple black, but really, really well done. I think this is like a bad example of that, like reconstruction, deconstruction. Alberta Freddy to me is like a brand that's like, it's like a Max Mara. It's like Giorgio Armani. It's just very simple and it's not really meant to be like super duper fashion forward. Let's stick to that then. Like let's stay to the brand ethos here because evidently we can't do fashion forward super duper well. So let's just do wealthy women who are not super interesting styles and we'll be happy with it, I promise. Well, I don't promise that, but we can try to be happy with it. Next up we have Finn Wolfhart. Now, this is a full custom Saint Laurent look. It's in a black silk. It's a jumpsuit, yeah, I know. It's a full jumpsuit, shout out Finn. It looks like it has sort of a pussy bow blouse of some sort, it, you know, you look like you have untied sort of pieces, which it'd be a very small pussy bow blouse, but Yves Saint Laurent sort of brought the pussy bow Back in the 1970s, he was inspired by Chanel herself, who sort of helped to make it popular. It's a jumpsuit. Like, for a jumpsuit, I think it fits pretty decently. Like, it could be a lot baggier, a lot weirder, a lot stranger. The undone bow panels that flow down does cover a lot of what's going on in the center, so, like, I really can't tell what's going on with the fit of it, but I appreciate that Finn is doing something different. He's trying something a little bit out there, a little bit strange, a little bit weird. I respect it. Let's hope for more fashion forwardy looks like this in the future from Finn. Next up we have Idris Elba. He's wearing Gucci. It's a blue suit with black lapels. I love, love the cut of the suit. It looks almost like it's double breasted, but it's really not double breasted. It's just that the left side is pulled over quite far and then black buttons dot down, but it's just one line of black buttons. I think it's really honestly Cool, it's different from what we usually see with men's where the pants fit like decently. It has a little flare at the bottom there. I wish maybe we hadn't flared it. We just had done like a little bit more of a straight line. I think the jacket honestly is actually very, very cool. Normally black and blue, they don't always go together, but I think in this case we'll allow it. The white shirt, decent. The bow tie, honestly, she's a little bit big. She's a little bit floppy. I like her. She's a little bit droopy sort of feeling. A little bit 70s in my mind. Honestly, the look is a little bit 70s to a degree in my head. But honestly, I think it's like a nice little take on menswear. Again, can, very simple, very subtle. The details are important. I think that that button and that pull over of that jacket, I think it just does it. I think it's nice, I think it's sexy, I think it's sweet. Now I know you guys are gonna be like, Luke, you're being so nice, but like, it's can, you know what I mean? Like, I can't expect crazy kooky over the top. You gotta expect beauty, glamour, gorge vibes, and that's what I think we're getting here. Next up we have Iris Law, and she is wearing Dior. I presume this is custom, because I'm not gonna look through that Dior collection. I'm good, I've done it. I'm fine. Thank you, everybody. It's essentially a bodice that has little eyelets and then it's all strung up. So it's very corsety looking. There's like a zipper up the front though, which I feel like takes us out of the, the excitement of it being a corset. You know what I mean? Like if it's going to be like a lace up corset whole detail, like why not just make it a lace up corset in general? You know what I mean? The zipper just sort of takes us out of 
the fantasy of it. I think that's my my big issue. I understand for Maria Grazia, it's accessibility, women, da 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 da. Listen, I love that. I think that's great. I think that's wonderful. But like, if we're gonna commit to a thing, let's just commit to it. You know what I mean? Like we're in a lace up corset. Why not just let it be a lace up corset? And then we get into the movie and we loosen it. That's all we really gotta do, people. As for the skirt, it has a little belt, a little bit of grommetage going on. It's a, it's a bit of a wide skirt, and I can't tell if it's pleated or not. Maybe it's not pleated, but it's gathered. You can see that there's little swags of fabric. I don't know, I wish we'd had, again, a sort of like lace-up detail going throughout the skirt, and the shape of the skirt is really weird against the corset top. You know what I mean? I just don't think it connects super duper well. Maybe we're going for like Y2K, young generation, Gen Z, fitted top, baggy pants, baggy skirt kind of vibe. And if that's it, I don't understand it. That's okay, I get it. But it just feels like there's a disconnect there. And again, with the skirt, like why not just do an eyelet belt situation, lace up kind of detail at the waist of the skirt. And then you're tying the two things together and it all works out really lovely. That's just my thoughts on it. So I appreciate that Iris was going somewhere. I just feel like we were taken out of the fantasy of wherever we were supposed to go multiple different times. And it's kind of like uncomfortable for me. I also feel like we could have done like a jewelry moment. You know what I mean? Like something crazy kooky. There's a lot of blank space here or here at the waist. Pull out some like archival Dior jewelry. Make it a moment. Make it kooky. Make it crazy. Make it over the top. Make it drama. Again, no, we don't. We don't do that. That's too much of an ask, which is uncomfortable in my opinion. Next up we have Isabel Huppert and she is wearing Balenciaga. I can't tell if this is custom or if this is from a collection of seasons past. I looked at some of the most recent Balenciaga collections and I feel like, though in my opinion it looks like it's sort of referencing looks from fall 2020 which had this very very draped and gathered and texturized sort of dress that is very much so fitted. It has gloves although here Isabel Huppert, her look is much more covered. It has a lot more coverage of different elements. And there's sort of like a drama, dramatic train going on. You know, it's very Balenciaga. Again, I haven't like seen the actual look, so I think this is custom. And I also appreciate that Isabel Huppert wears like custom Balenciaga. I think it's really funny because it's this weird, again, like Demna Vasalia dichotomy of like, He's very streetwear cool, you know, on one end we're dressing like Kim Kardashian and Alexa Demi, and then on the other hand it's like legendary iconic actress Isabel Hubert. You know what I mean? Like it's just, I think it's that funny Demna dichotomy. We should just call him Double D. Dichotomous Demna. The one issue that I have is really, it's not with the panta shoe, which again now is sort of like a Demna staple. Again, it does come from Margiela where he used to work, but he sort of turned it into his own vibe. My only issue really comes from like, we can see that the shoe is like a weird placement. The heel of that shoe, not like the stiletto heel, but like the heel as in the back part of that shoe, it juts out weirdly. And I understand because it's like a lycra spandex fabric that is really like stretched and attached and shows every nook and cranny and crevice, that's what it's gonna look like. But it just always throws me off. Like unless those shoes fit perfectly and the back of the Achilles heel fits into that shoe, it just always looks a little bit strange. That's my one sort of issue. And also like the heel, it's fine. The pointy toe heel, I get it. Although again, like I just feel like it hits a weird angle. It's very L angled. It's very right angle of it. But maybe that's the Lenciaga-ness of it. I don't hate it. I just feel like I maybe have seen it enough at this point that I would like a little bit more from Balenciaga on a red carpet moment. I think that there have been great Isabel Huppert Balenciaga moments in the past. I feel like we didn't get enough of the old couture out and about and I feel like, listen, if anybody should be allowed to wear Balenciaga haute couture, Isabel Huppert. So let's, let's let it happen for the people. Next up we have Jamie She and she is wearing Marc Jacobs. This is from the spring 2022 collection. Jamie's wearing a look, but a lot of the elements of the look have sort of been stripped away. There is a beanie and a snood and a jacket and a stole that was on the runway and is not here. Instead, Jamie has just done this purple bodysuit with little hip cutouts and then this very like 1960s graphic, maybe it's not even 1960s, maybe, I don't know. I don't know exactly the period that it, that the graphic is, but I do think it's very intriguing. I do think it's actually kind of lovely in that red and that gray. And then she's worn sort of like a dark eggplant, almost like a rust, very oxidized blood glove color. 
Honestly, I like the look. It's very strange, it doesn't really make any sense, but I do think it's intriguing. I almost wish we had added some sort of element of like stoliness, because I think it could have used that. Listen, I get it, it's like the South of France is probably hot as balls out, but a little bit of drama doesn't hurt. And again, like we're gonna go into an air-conditioned movie theater, so like we could just take it off when we get in there. I do think the jewelry placement is really, really smart. Putting those diamonds over the turtleneck works. They're very visible light silver against that purple and then the earrings i think it makes sense i think it looks sweet i do wish that we had, had a little bit more drama maybe a stole of some sort but i think it's a strange but weird look that in my opinion from like a very avant fashion perspective pretty solid not a post next up we have jennifer conley and she's wearing custom louis vuitton it is a off the shoulder silver gown with flecks of black inside. So the silver looks almost like it's texturized. So it looks like it's been like heat manipulated. So it creates that sort of crumply texture. And then you can just see little flecks of black underneath. It's almost like the dress was black and then it was painted over in silver. And as time has gone on, the silver flecks of paint have sort of flown off. And so we're starting to see the black come through. Honestly, I think it's actually a really good look. Like it's very simple in terms of cut silhouette it fits pretty well the waist i wish fit just a little bit better but it looks very cool and at the same time i think it also has that nicolas jesquier intrigue you do have this silver with the black motif sort of running throughout it adds a little bit of you know an architectural element maybe it's marbleized maybe it's a reference to granite or stone or something i just think it's a nice look it fits pretty decently the motif is entrenching it's intriguing, it's deep. Off the shoulder I think really is like the wow moment. It just adds a little bit of fun, a little bit of difference. The sleeves work. Overall, like I think it's just a nice look. This is what I want from custom Louis Vuitton is like these moments where it's just pretty, but like weird, but weird, but pretty. You know what I mean? We have another Jennifer Conley look. It's from fall 2022, and it seems like there's been an update on the look. We've kept this sort of overall dress that's heavily embellished and embroidered to look almost like a, say, you know, handkerchief cut, a very handkerchief silhouette. You can see that it sort of dips up in the front, but on the sides it also dips up, but then it sort of has four panels that lay out in the front and the back, one on each side, and that creates a very interesting handkerchief cut. But with Nicolas Jesquier, it's also layered in terms of nuance. It's sort of an overall style dress that you have to wear something underneath. Me, it's very like 1960s, 1970s-ish to a degree. And then what they've done is instead of that like big turtleneck, which I think is smart to have done away with for Can, is we've done a little white blouse with a little frilly sort of collar and a little bit of a white sort of string flowing down. And then we've kept the big red boots. Listen, I do think that honestly, like it weirdly enough, it's strange and it's weird and how much sense it actually makes, I don't know. But in the context of Nicolas Jesquier, it makes quite a bit of sense. There is a very sort of 1960s, 1970s flow that he's been referencing recently. The use of the handkerchief cut is really, really sweet. The sort of taking of the overall cut also is different and intriguing, has Again, sort of like 1960s flair to it. The red boots, very Nancy Sinatra. These boots are gonna walk all over you. I like it, it's weird, doesn't make any sense, but like, I, I enjoy it. Next up we have Julia Roberts. She is wearing Dior and she's just doing full new look. You know what I mean? She is doing bar jacket and it's great. I think when Maria Grazia hits that simplicity in a way where it's not trying to like prove a point, it's fine. It's very, very fine. The bar jacket, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful bar jacket in black. It's stunning, like the way that it fits. There is like a little strip. We're gonna zoom in really close. You can see the strip. That's what's emphasizing the waist, which I'm not gonna go into my diatribe about Maria Grazia and making things more everyday wearable because the original Dior bar jackets were corseted. So you'd have to wear a corset underneath in order to like actually get that real wasp waist. But considering that it's, it's a Dior, or jacket. I'm happy about it. We don't really need the strap. We don't need the strap, but it's okay. Jacket's much more like tailoring fabric. The skirt a little bit more frilly and flowy, but it does look really, really nice. Captures a real sort of beautiful elegance of like the 1950s and stunning. It, like it works. I think she looks really, really great. Sometimes I think anybody that is wearing Dior is like sleeping with the enemy, but I think Julia Roberts is proving us absolutely that that's not the case here today in this moment. We then have Julia Roberts in a Louis Vuitton look. It is a pantsuit. It has a little bit of a tailed situation going on. So it's pretty much like a fitted jacket. And then we can see behind her that there are tails that are coming down. Not really crazy. 
about it. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's very simple LV, the menswear inspiration. I don't really know. I kind of almost am like waiting for the weird Nicolas Jeskier moment to hit. You know what I mean? I'm waiting for like something strange to happen. Like I'm waiting for her to turn around and it's like, I don't know. There's like an alien digging through. The pant also I feel like fits weird. I don't know. Just from like, maybe it's the angle that we have. It just like that cut the way that it, uh, nah, nah. not my favorite Julia Roberts look. It's like too simple. Whereas that Dior look is so simple, but it works because it's a great sort of reference and it fits phenomenally. I wish we'd done like a little bit more in the LV wheelhouse. I wish we'd gone that little extra strange step further. That is very Nicolas Jaskier. All right, listen, the setup might change throughout these videos, but listen, like we're gonna move and groove, you know? Two weeks can, not my fault. Next up we have Julianne Moore and she is wearing what I believe is custom Bottega Veneta. Now listen, I'm not trying to be like, oh my God, Luke, you're a psychic, but like, Luke, you're a psychic. I'm pretty positive it might've either been during the fall 2022 Milan reviews that I said something along the lines of it feels like Bottega is getting into evening wear and it feels like we're going to be getting like a red carpet moment from Mathieu Bazzi and I don't think I was wrong. I could have also said that for the Oscars or maybe the Vanity Fair after party, but I love this look because it's very Bottega and Bottega is a brand that historically is not really about like monograms being super flashy. It's very fucking expensive and B, subtle demure, quiet luxury that like people on TikTok love to talk about. That is Bottega. Like that's the brand. The ad campaigns from like the 60s and the 70s literally were like, you don't need a monogram. It's it's fine. The girls will know. And like, I think that's, that's what's going on here. Now, essentially this is a black twill gown, which is plunging in terms of neckline. It has a big sort of gathered skirt. And now those things to me aren't exactly like the most important parts. Do I think it fits decently enough? Yes. Do I think it's very sort of subtle? Absolutely. And in the grand scheme of things, I'd say like even for can, maybe this is a little bit too subtle, but can devil in the details. The straps of this gown are where this gown shines and it's all I need for it to shine. Now, if we look at the Bottega Fall 2022 collection, because you know, bitch loves the rough fronts, these straps have these knots. Now, if you guys are avid followers of Bottega's accessories, then you already know what's going on. But if you're not, Bottega has a few different bags, whether it's the Jody bag or the knot bag, where essentially there is like tied knot in the handle of the bag. Sometimes it's done in like the woven interaccio leather. Sometimes it's just done in sort of regular, normal, non-textured leather, but the knots exist. It's something that has been going on for quite some time. I think it was under Daniel Lee as well, but Mathieu Blasi was also studio director under Daniel Lee. So like, Matthew, he knows what he's doing. What's really so brilliant about that Bottega collection was the subtle details that went into it and sort of very much so aligned with the house codes of Bottega, which is don't do too much, just do a lot in the details and make those details really like for the girls that get it. What happened was from fall 2022 on the runway, we saw these dresses that were leather dresses and they had knotted straps. So what we've done is we just converted that into more of like a red carpet, simplistic sort of black twill experience. And I love it. I think it's brilliant. I think it's smart. I think it is perfectly Bottega. I think honestly, it fits in not only with the brand's house codes, but it fits in with the sort of subtle beauty of can. I think Julianne Moore looks stunning in it. And I'm hearing little things like maybe Julianne Moore is gonna become a Bottega girl. So like who knows? And if that's the case, we love to see it. I'm intrigued, I'm excited. And I think looks like these are what is making me excited to see like the Bottega Veneta PR strategy in terms of red carpet looks as time goes on. I mean, Cody Smith McPhee, who we saw at the Oscars is a really, really great example of like looks put together. Listen, Met Gala, it could have been better, but Can is giving me hope. Can is giving me a lot of hope. So I'm excited for the Bottega takeover. The Botecover. The Botecover? Yeah, I don't know. I'm gonna work on that. But honestly, I think it's a really, really great dress. Listen, again, it has pockets. She's gathered. Simplistic in terms of bodice. She fits well, but the straps really are like the moment. Like that's what we're looking for at Cannes. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you, Mathieu. Thank you, Julianne. Love to see it. It's a moment. It's hot and sexy for the girls. Next up we have Katherine Langford and she is wearing Prada. Now this is a custom look, I believe. It's essentially a silver gown that is full of silver reflective paillettes. Pretty simple in the front, you know what I mean? Like there's not too, too much going on. It's, well, except for like 
the silver paillettes all over the place. Now, if we're looking at the back of the dress, that's where it really gets somewhat sort of interesting. Now, in my opinion, the look seems to be inspired by kimonos and specifically like the obi, which is the beautiful sort of large belt that can be decoratively sort of turned into a bunch of different styles of bows. But it looks like it's sort of the back of an obi bow. I'm not sure if that's like technically cultural appropriation because I don't really feel like we're doing like full kimono, gown, etc., etc. But it does feel like we're just sort of taking from the beauty of the obi and sort of bringing it into a little evening wear experience. So like, I'm unsure. I wouldn't think. Who am I to say? But when I look at it, that's kind of what I'm seeing. And honestly, I think it's beautiful. I also think the train works. I think it's big. I think it's flowing. The embroidery of it is very Prada-esque. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't make me feel strange or weird. It looks pretty nice. I think the obi bow is like the best part of it. So thank you, Prada. Next up, we have Kristen Stewart and she is wearing Chanel. Now this is from the, what, spring 2022 haute couture season? No, fall 2020? I, honestly, I don't know. I don't really care. There's the runway image, you see it. I'm tired of dabbling between the two seasons currently. So essentially what we have on Kristen is a large multicolored top. This collection was specifically inspired by constructivists of Russia, which like, shout out to the girls and the guys but we have like a turtleneck crop top that is full of a colorful reflective motif and then we have a large cream front bow sash skirt that like falls away it just it's a strange look it wasn't really great on the runway and again i just don't know why for like k stew we chose that again i'm not trying to like be anybody's stylist but like that chanel collection was really like not totally horrific so why didn't we like choose something better? Maybe there wasn't. Also like Kristen Stewart can't get a custom look. What's with that? What's with that? Kristen Stewart is keeping Chanel cool. We need that. Just unappealing. Doesn't really look intriguing. There's no sort of tie in between the two. I feel like this is the moment for Chanel to just like do really, really subtle beauty. Like just very subtle, simple, devil in the details, Coco Chanel, straight to the like 1920s, 1930s vibe. And we didn't do that we did whatever this monstrosity is. And that's the sad part, hurts my soul. Next up we have Lashana Lynch and she is wearing custom Fendi. Now I believe that it's based on a look from the spring 2022 Haute Couture collection. Although I think Lashana's is done in all white whereas the original on the runway was done in sort of like a silvery goldish color. I think the one now today on Lashana in like full white, much better. Honestly, I think she's vision white. I think the look, you can even just see that there's that adaptation of the neckline. On the runway, it's this like crumply, weird, four skinny turtleneck. And then on Lashana, it's just this like nice little cropped crew neck. It's perfect. That's all you need. And I think for Kim Jones, like, I don't want to say it's very like menswear, but it just, it looks better. It looks cleaner. It looks crisper. The motif that runs throughout to me feels very... I don't want to say William Morris because I don't actually know if it's like a William Morris, but it feels very tapestry, textile, arts and crafts movement e kind of feeling, you know, when you like do the mirroring of the tapestries and all that sort of stuff. And then you have the simple sort of white straps that fall out. It get it adds just like a tiny little bit of intrigue to the look. You know what I mean? Like it's not doing too much. It's not being super crazy over the top. I do wish that Lashana had like worn them over her arms. I understand like it's, you know, we're moving, we're grooving, I get it. But just think it would have added like that tiny little bit of drama to it. Cause coming from underneath, it's a little bit strange. Whereas over top, it feels almost like a little bit of a stole, but it's not really a stole. But honestly, I think that what we did here from Fendi is brilliant. I think the adaptation to the white is wonderful. I think the neckline, I think that neckline is stunning. I think it's gorgeous. I think it's lovely. Um, the straps, leaving them perfectly white and intact. It's great. Honestly, like it's a nice look. Not really super crazy, not really super out there, but again, devil in details, much better adaptation than the original at the very least. Next up, we have Letitia Wright, and she is wearing Fendi Haute Couture as well. Now, this, again, is from spring 2022. Honestly, I like this better than the runway, too. I think that, I guess, whoever's doing the tailoring, the fittings for these red carpets, they know what they're doing. Thank you. Appreciate it. Love it. Wonderful. It's pretty much a large sort of wool, I believe, 
tailored coat. It has a very, very high neckline. It has a very, very sort of subtle layover side. And then it just sort of flares out very like 1960s cut. It's like a little mini dress jacket experience. The sleeves fit wonderfully. Also, when we look at the runway image and we look at that waist, it's strange. Whereas on the t-shirt, it fits perfectly. Like it just beautifully forms out in a little subtle hourglass shape. Like the way that it just hits at that bottom is like sexy. You know what I mean? Like it's just, it's just a hotly done coat. And I think that's like the most important thing for Kim Jong is like when we are doing our subtle little detail moments, exquisite, perfect, wonderful. And I think this is a great example of that. I believe that there is an underskirt here, which creates like a sort of, I don't want to say tail train, cause I'm not really sure if it's actually meant to like be representative of coat tails, but it does sort of add like a little tail train experience. I don't hate it. I don't love it. I don't think it's like brilliant. I wish that we were sort of like working to make something on that coat sort of a part of the drama of the train. But you know, it's not like the worst thing I've ever seen in my entire life. It's not the best thing, far from it. It doesn't hinder the look so, so much. I think really the coat dress is brilliant, perfect. I think the skirt, not super necessary because it's just a beautifully fitted coat dress. And again, I think it's hard when you have like the color of the coat dress is like a, you know, beautiful black, but that silk of the skirt is like a deeper black. So it almost looks like you're looking at a navy blue coat jacket, whereas the skirt is black. So like it's hard there. I wish we had just done like a dramatic train tail, tail train. I just think it would have sort of emphasized the idea of tailoring and bringing that to the Fendi Haute Couture sort of ateliers and all those sorts of things. But the fit, good. Happy with it. Thank you. Next up, we have Lori Harvey. She is wearing a yellow draped and also flounced strapless gown. It's very much so a princess cut. The bodice fits very, very well. And we can see at the bust, there is a sort of flounce that's layered on top of itself. And then at the waist, we utilize the fabric to create an emphasis on this hourglass shape. It's not exactly the most perfectly gathered gathering at the waist, but like, it's not a bell. Thank you, people. And then from that bodice, it flows out back into this large sort of flounced, very sort of stripped skirt. Honestly, I appreciate the fact that at least we have like some sort of coherence between the bust line and the skirt. And again, we're not doing anything super duper crazy with the waist, so it doesn't feel like it's super out of place whatsoever. It actually sort of blends in really, really well. Honestly, Am I like obsessed with it? No. But do I think it's a pretty dress? Do I think it works? Do I think that it has a nice texture? Do I think it has a nice sort of fit? Do I think it has a nice sort of beautiful princess feeling to it? Beautiful can experience? Yeah, absolutely. Do I want Lori Harvey to be like a little bit more fashion forward? Absolutely. I feel like her and Alexandre Vautier could have done like a cool 80s moment. But if we're doing pretty, pretty princess, not opposed. I think it works. I think it looks nice. The jewelry is fine. Like we're good. We're happy with it. Thank you. I feel like I'm being so nice, but also like it's Ken. Next up we have Naomi Campbell and she is wearing Valentina. And this is from the fall 2022 ready to wear collection. It is part of that pure Paolo PP pink and very much so is a sheer gown that is full of little sort of synthetic bright pink fabric flowers that are reflective. I'm sure they're made with some sort of metallic elements to them, but I think it's a nice look. I also feel like technically it's a little bit different from the runway look because as we can see here, there's a little tiny baby slit at the armpit. I think it's nice. I don't know if it was done for like fit. I don't know if it was done just cause that's what Naomi wanted it to be done. I don't know if it's a custom look. And so we just, we did what we did, but I think it's a nice really subtle little tiny baby detail that looks lovely. I also think the fabric flowers are gorgeous. And again, they're full. So although this is a sheer dress, unless you're looking up close, you really wouldn't know that and we appreciate it ever so much. I know a lot of people thought this collection was like very boring and very uninteresting and oh, it's all just bright pink, whatever. I think Propello has done a good job of, at least when we look at it on the red carpet, differentiating these looks very much so. I know that we saw Jenna Ortega, who I called Mia Reed at the Met Gala wearing a similar look, but mini dress versus gown, they don't look nearly the same and they don't have nearly the same sort of feeling. So again, if you're like looking at that collection and thinking about that collection a lot. It's about the detail. It is really about the fact that these are all garments that they do differ. They do look subtly different to each other. And you really have to just be looking. I think the 
flowers are like actually magnificent. The way that they reflect the light off of them is really, really cool. They look lovely. It just, it creates a really beautiful sort of different texture than we normally are used to, I would say, especially when it comes to floral applique. I'm happy with it. Next up we have Noah Beck and he is wearing Ami Paris and it's a interesting suit. Listen, again, subtle detail. I don't really expect like Noah Beck to do something crazy. Otherwise I'd say like, what the heck? It's an intriguingly cut. I don't know if I love the exact fit of it. If the photo that we're looking at, like the shoulder looks a little bit wonky, the sleeve looks a little bit wonky. That bodice of that jacket is really, really interesting. The fact that you can't see buttons, the fact that it sort of curves, cuts in, and then sort of creates an obtuse angle. It's really, really nice. The pants, they're okay. They're a little bit baggy. We could have tailored them a little bit more. But the use of the white shirt with the nice little bow tie experience, like it, it looks nice. I think the shoes could have been better. It's like a boot. I appreciate that, Noah, thank you. The black against the white just looks kind of like, I don't know. We could have done something silvery, some, you know, something a little bit. But overall, I appreciate that jacket's idea. The execution I'm a little bit less obsessed with. And I think that's the thing. If like you're doing tailoring, it has to be superb superb it's not exactly that you know what i mean from like the chest great everything else questionable so i have no problem with ami Paris and noah back working together i think it's, it's a thing that makes sense i understand it i just wish we were putting like a little bit more effort into the red carpets just to make them really like crisp you know what i mean like the brand is not fashion forward over the top all that sort of stuff it's a brand that is very simple it is very sort of wearable it's very accessible in terms of like mainstream anybody could sort of pick something out and wear it so when we're doing red carpet that is the simple it has to like perfection otherwise it's like what are we doing what's the point next up we have raylene shaw and she is wearing michael cinco and he is a star now this gown is a hand painted gown that is meant to mirror the northern lights that you see in the north i think it's great like the fact that it's this neon green is really really lovely and the fact that it's hand painted is also really really nice again the fit of it phenomenal you know what i mean like that bodice fits fantastically the straps are a little bit odd but like they're fine and the skirt is gorgeous the fact that you also have this motif that creates almost like a faux texture of like flounces and rolling cascading sort of tides is really really nice it looks great like it fits beautifully the motif is really really interesting again like hand painted it's just a nice look and again silhouette very simple beautiful princess feeling and at the same time the motif is intriguing gorgeous and like cause a little bit of stir a little bit of drama but not too much you know what i mean like it's not so crazy can't be over the top but it's just enough just enough to make it memorable so shout out raylene shaw shout out michael Cinco. cute look next up we have suju park and she is wearing nenzi dojaka the london-based designer who is the winner of the what 2021 lvmh prize dojaka is honestly a stellar sort of star within the london fashion scene and yeah i just like Think she's brilliant so the thing is we have a white sheer gown of sorts essentially it, it is made up of a sort of gathered bra cut which now has become like a nenzi sort of house code and then we have a bra sort of outline that's created of a bunch of different elastic straps then the skirt sort of jets in and attaches itself to the bra but leaves quite a lot of skin on display and then those little sort of jets become a little bit more opaque as we reach the skirt it has a high sort of slit there are elastic strings that come down and sort of line the skirt or at least like flow down in the midst of the slit listen in the grand scheme of things very very simple but at the same time very nenzu dojaka very much so i think what young people are wearing in the sense of cutouts body on display not really an issue not really a problem the other thing is like these styles are beautifully made. Like, Nenzi is one of the smart designers who's taken the money from that LVMH prize and put it all into production, which means up in quality of fabrics, up in quality of the way things are made, up in quality of the manufacturers that she's working with. And so that's kind of what we're seeing here. It's also just nice to see a really cool young designer like this on the carpet. Nenzi is like a favorite, I would say, of quite a lot of models and celebrities. And so, I'm just happy to see the look. You know what I mean? Like, it's a good look. Very classic Nenzi. Normally, you don't really see a lot of white in Nenzi Dojaka styles. It's usually black, brown, red, orange. But to see the white, I think, is nice. It's very ethereal. It looks 
good, looks sweet. We love to see it. Next up, we have Tilda Swinton and she is wearing Chanel Fall 2022. Listen, she does make it look much, much better than the look initially. It seems like we've fitted it much better. Honestly, like it looks stunning. The collection also is based on Scotland, the River Tweed, which is a river in Scotland called the River Tweed, where tweed fabric sort of comes from. On top of that, the collection was sort of a breakdown of Chanel's history with Scotland, which Chanel used to produce a lot of their cashmeres there. So I would say that this is probably like a little cashmere knit experience going on. And then what we've done is we've put a whole lot of crystal blue bedazzled all along the neckline. Not really crazy, not really over the top, you know, very simple. But what we've done that's rather nice is at least like a little bit of a mermaid skirt. It just allows that fit fine and dandy and happy and go lucky, but it creates some sort of shape. Whereas on the runway, we can see that like she's a little bit blobby she just doesn't really do anything so here with tilda it's just nice to see that she's given a little bit of something something you know what i mean like we're not trying to focus on the waist it's just a nicely fitted gown with a nice little mermaid to make it a little bit angular and it looks sweet shockingly like i think it's nice i think it's tilda sort of doing respectable a little bit more buttoned up conservative can but I'm happy with it. Considering what we could see from Chanel, this is decent. I will take this any day of the week. Next up, we have Tom Cruise. He's wearing Armani. Nothing crazy, really. It's pretty much your, your standard tuxedo sort of suit. Pants fit decently. The jacket fits honestly really well. Like, it looks pretty solid. The bow tie is, like, decent. It's fine. The shirt, you know, we can see the pleating going on in there. Nothing, you know, it's Tom Cruise and it's can't. So, like, fine. Tom Cruise shows up to the VMAs, you know I'm going to be on his ass. And finally, for our part one of the Cannes 2022 roast and review, we have Viola Davis. She's wearing Alexander McQueen. It is a bright, sunshiny yellow. We can see that it's an off-the-shoulder gown with a sort of flounce. There is a little short cropped sleeve. And then we can see the boning of the bodice, very much so there. There's a yellow strip that sort of obviously like hides the seam at the waist where the bodice and the skirt were connected. And then we have quite a, a bit of, you know, gatheredness going on in this big silk skirt. It's not my favorite. I think it's very simple and I think that's fine in the context of like with McQueen. And now I want more because especially with like certain looks that we've seen in recent times where it's supposed to be like kooky crazy over the top, we got blah. The other thing here with like this look specifically is look at the skirt. She's crinkled and she's wrinkled. And like Viola Davis deserves better than that. I stand by that to the umpteenth degree. Like if there's one human being that I will fight for, she is kind, she is smart, she is important. And she doesn't deserve a skirt wrinkle like that. So on top of that, I just think the look overall like is not super exciting, cool, amazing, wonderful. I don't know what Viola Davis is like in or what she's attending or whatever, but like feel like if there's anybody that's really gonna be a, a method dresser, Viola Davis would handle it. This like kind of blah, uninteresting, poor fabric choice, Alexander McQueen yellow sunshine dress is just not, it's just not the vibe. Not what I want, not what I need, not what I deserve, not what I expect. So. so that is the end of our can part one fashion roast and review. Let's talk about best and worst though. I mean, best. I gotta give it to Anne Hathaway and that Armani Privé just was untouchable, I would say. Genuinely untouchable, wonderful, stunning, gorgeous, lovely, iconic. As for worst, I was just about to say there wasn't anybody that was so horrible but Kristen Stewart and Chanel. What else do you want me to say? Garbage offensive to the eyeball. With that, again, I'd like to say a huge shout out and thank you to LG for sponsoring today's video. So click the link in the description box below. And again, I just want to say a huge shout out to LG who sponsored today's video. Again, click the link in the description box below to check out the LG Cinebeam HU715QW projector. It's stunning. It's gorgeous. I'm looking at her over here and I'm just like, hi. Thank you guys so much for watching. And there will be a part two to our can roast and review. So stay tuned. I think it's gonna be coming very shortly after this video. So, you know, keep your eyes peeled if Kristen Stewart's Chanel video didn't like burn them off. So thank you guys for watching. I'll see you in the next one and